Thank you for coming along with On The Spot Films. We're on our way today to Memphis, Tennessee. We're trying to locate the boyhood home of Machine Gun Kelly, FBI's public enemy number one back in the 30s. Now, some say that George Kelly Barnes was born in Memphis in 1895, but his son said in a book that Kelly was actually born in Chicago in 1900 and that the family moved to Memphis when George was only two. Unlike other noted gangsters of that era like John Dillinger and Pretty Boy Floyd, Bunny and Clyde, they all grew up in poverty. However, George Kelly grew up in an upper middle class family in this upscale neighborhood, especially upscale back in 1920s. Now, this, his home here is located at 1992 Cowden Avenue, C-O-W-D-E-N. Now, George's daddy was an insurance executive and had a strained relationship with his son because his son became an embarrassment to the family for such stunts as selling bootleg whiskey from the truck, trunk of his car while still in high school and being arrested by Memphis police and then having to depend on his daddy's connection to keep him out of jail. Now George went to Idlewild Grammar School and went to Central High School in Memphis. George's mother, who was Elizabeth Kelly, was her maiden name, Kelly Barnes, passed away just a few months before George graduated from Central. Now, some people believe that George took the name Kelly to protect his family's reputation from his illegal acts. Now, George did try college, but that didn't last very long. But fortunately, he did meet his future wife, Geneva Ramsey, the daughter of a Memphis businessman. Now, after marrying Geneva, George tried several jobs. Uh, he tried everything from driving a cab to selling insurance. Nothing seemed to work for George. So he returned back to his old ways that he had discovered while in high school, bootlegging. Geneva threatened to leave unless George gave up his bootlegging, and especially his unsavory characters that he associated with in that business. Now she left him several times, but he would always talk her into coming back. But now finally, after enough, she took the two boys that they had together, left, and then divorced George. Now, after Geneva left, George was in and out of jail, so much so that he was well known by the Memphis police. So he decided it might be best if he carried his bootlegging career somewhere else. So George went to Oklahoma City and went to work for a bootlegger there by the name of Little Steve Anderson. Uh, now, Little Steve had a girlfriend by the name of Catherine Thorne. Now, Catherine looked really good, so it wasn't long till Catherine and George developed a romance. Uh, and finally, they, they took Little Steve's new Cadillac and his favorite dog, and they left Oklahoma went and joined some of George's underworld friends uh, that he had met while serving time for bootlegging the Indians at uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And uh, with encouragement from his now wife, Catherine, George was transformed from a small-time bootlegger into Machine Gun Kelly, a big-time bank robber. Now, although bank robbing was a lucrative uh, profession, it was also dangerous. So on the 30th of November 1932, George, Albert Bates, and Eddie Doyle robbed the Tupelo Savings Bank of $38,000 in Tupelo, Mississippi. Now George Kelly and Albert Bates had already dis uh, decided to go into a more profession a profitable business, kidnapping. 
Now their first uh, couple attempts did not work out too well. Uh, they kept kidnapping people that didn't have enough money to pay them. And they had to let them go. But on July the 22nd, 1933, Catherine got her stated wish. The kidnapping of Charles Urschel, a wealthy Oklahoma City oil man, propelled Machine Gun Kelly to the top of the FBI's most wanted list. George and his bank robbing partner, Albert Bates, rushed into the Urschel, Oklahoma City mansion, wheeling a machine gun and pistols. They found Urschel and his wife playing bridge with their friends, Walter Jarrett and his wife. Now the kidnappers couldn't figure out which one was Charles Urschel, so they took both men. However, by the time that the kidnappers reached the south side of Oklahoma City, they had finally figured it out, so they let Walter Jarrett go. They blindfolded Urschel and drove to Paradise, Texas, where Catherine's mother, Ora, and her husband, Robert Boss Shannon, had a farmhouse. Now this is it. They helped Charles Urschel in the little extended room that you see there on the back. After one week, they had received the largest payoff ever, $200,000. And true to form for George Machine Gun Kelly, his prisoner was released unharmed. Unfortunately for the kidnappers, Urschel was extremely helpful to the FBI in locating the Shannon farm. So soon, Boss Shannon, Ora, and others were arrested and tried and sentenced to life in prison. Now, Catherine and George were still on the run for the next two months. However, when law enforcement learned that the Kellys might be staying in Memphis, staying at a friend's house, John Titchener, at 1408 Rainier Street. In the early morning hours of 26 September 1933, FBI agents and Memphis police stormed this house. With Memphis police in the lead, as it was at that time, FBI agents were not allowed to carry weapons. Now, there are different stories as to what happened next. John Tishner stated that Kelly had stepped out to get the morning newspaper and forgot to lock the front door back. He had gone to the bathroom and was in the bathroom when the raid took place. Another story was that Kelly came to the front door with a gun in his hand and the police commander stuck a shotgun in his belly and he dropped his pistol and said, Don't shoot, G-Men. One story was that Catherine was passed out and Kelly was half asleep from the night's drinking. Now, this is George Kelly being taken from the Shelby County Jail in Memphis on his way to trial in Oklahoma City. In trial, Catherine, and everyone else too, tried to convince the court that George first forced her into a life of crime and that she knew nothing whatsoever about the Urschel kidnapping and certainly did not write the kidnapping ransom note. George and Catherine were both sentenced to life in prison. Now she loved the notoriety and that she, she really expected that her looks and charm uh, to, be, to win the day. But after two hours they were found guilty. Now, George Machine Gun Kelly spent the rest of his life in federal prison as a model prisoner. And in 1951, he was transferred from Alcatraz, where he had been for the last 17 years, back to Fort Leavenworth. And on his birthday, on the 18th of July, 1954, George Machine Gun Kelly died of a massive heart attack. Now here's a newspaper account of his body being taken 
off the train in Paradise, Texas. And this is Robert Boss Shannon at Kelly's funeral. It's believed that he actually paid for Kelly's, uh, for his funeral. Now Kelly is buried at the Cottondale Cemetery near Paradise in Cottondale, Texas. Now his stepdaddy-in-law, Robert Boss, had received an early pardon for his Democratic connections thanks to President Franklin Roosevelt. And Catherine and her mother, Ora, were released in June of 1958, four years after George's death. Catherine was 54 years old when she was released. Now, it's been said that Catherine was convicted mostly on the evidence provided by a handwriting analysis expert hired by the U.S. District Attorney in Oklahoma testifying she had written the ransom note. Now, Catherine was not allowed to hire her own expert. But after several years in the prison and hiring a new attorney, it was discovered that the FBI and U.S. District Office in Oklahoma had suppressed evidence in Catherine's case. Four days, they said before, the Kellys were apprehended in Memphis. The FBI was trying to decide who all was involved in the kidnapping. So they had their FBI handwriting analysis expert to look at the ransom note. And he reported that Catherine did not write the note. And that's one of the reasons she and her mother were let out. Now, after Catherine and Orr's release, Catherine took a bookkeeping job in an Oklahoma City hospital in order to stay close to her mother. And after her mother's death, they say that Catherine became a recluse. And she died in 1985 at the age of 81.